at Melbourne University. I'm the digital ethics lead there. I've also got uh, adjunct assistant at uh, a university in Namibia, where I uh, house as well. I've been in Southern Africa for 15 years, hard to which I am Australian with this slightly accent. So basically in situation I'm in at the moment, I've accumulated so much data in this five years of working with the Kumquase um, that, uh, that I'm unable to keep up with the analysis and publishing. So there are elements of this that are still very speculative and they're kind of bringing cross-pollinating from two projects, which may be a good idea or may not be a good idea, and you can decide. It, it, it may be difficult to keep up with this at time because it hasn't got that finished product element to it. So, but the take home, if you're gonna be looking for one, is that if we'll have partnerships with indigenous people, they can help us draw attention to the details of human experiences of time and by accounting for those human experiences of time, we may be able to enhance the way we integrate hope and imagination when making predictions such as in AI, or when we're trying to design technologies that sustain. If you get anything out of the talk from that, well done. <laughs> <laughs> so I've worked with indigenous people in technology projects for over 20 years, um, starting in North Australia, uh, where I learned from an Indigenous-led video project to communicate traditional knowledge about fire practices that are vital for caring for the country. And then since then, I've done lots of various projects about the way that research and development methodologies shape how we engage with the knowledges in different, in different communities, and particularly in Southern Africa, and, lots, and also quite a lot of work uh, both Africa in, and elsewhere in the Global South about rural community networks or telecommunication systems that um, rural inhabitants set up and support themselves. So I brought those sensitivities to our work in the Nine Nine Conservancy, which is in the northeast Kalahari, with the Tumkwasi people who live at the end of this long, 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 long road of the sort that you might find in WA, you know, one that goes on and on and on. Uh, oops. Um, so they're the largest lang language group of the so-called San people. And uh, the Nine Eye Conservancy was the first of its kind to be a communally owned conservation. So um, about 1,500 people live most of the time in Chunque, which is a tiny town at the end of this road, which is 50 kilometers from the Botswana border and about 280 kilometers from the nearest town. Um, and then another 1,500 people live in 40 settlements, which are called Narisi. Um, and in average, a Narisi might have 30 people, goes from 10 people to 60 people, usually around a family. Um, and they're scattered across 9,000 kilometers square of bush. So I've had quite a lot of engagements with sand groups in projects um, before this, but this is, the, this is the area where I've put my commitment, if you like, over the past few years. So in 2019, I got a grant from um, the Association of Progressive Communications to prototype a communication system across the Nainai. And so for this project, uh, my colleagues at the university in Namibia um, and um, locally um, amongst the um, uh built on an other projects that we've been trying to get, the like local radio projects <coughs> and so on, and worked with the traditional leader and, leader and the tribal authority. And um, the, the uh, San in general and uh, Chumkwase people are amongst the most marginalized groups in Namibia. So Namibia is a um, middle income country, but one of the most unequal countries in the world, and the San at the bottom of that social, economic, and political landscape. They have much lower access to health, care, education, um, and so on in Namibia. Few Narisi has electricity. Um, no mobile connectivity, no mo motor transport. So we designed this offline social network, which runs on a communal phone, um, which is what Liz Newman are looking at when we first um, implemented it there. So um, as few Marisi had uh, mobile connectivity at the time, the shared phone uh, stores voice messages 
and connects into what is called Scuttlebutt, which is a social online, offline, intermittent social network. And so um, essentially the, whole, the phone stores the whole of the social network, but not everybody on the node can access it. So that when you meet another phone or you connect to the internet, which they can't, um, but if they make, we, we made it um, so that it would bounce across Bluetooth. So you could basically, a phone could take that social network with it and transfer messages across it. So I'm um, coming together to tell stories, uh, exchange greetings to family member, uh, and those types of things, very important to um, Chunkwase people who, who have a, this, this lifestyle where they're, they're very disconnected from um, other members of their um, tribe. Uh, and so we had a, a speaker that the whole group, the whole family group could then listen to a message, you plug the phone and you, you, get, and you get the message. And the speaker was attached to solar charging for that. There was no other electricity. So as you can see here, um, Hun um, uh, is, uh, was, was one of the local people who helped with the implementation. So, so lo the, uh, local people were in charge of all of the installation, and that's 40 villages across a vast area. It, it is a very massive undertaking under those conditions. Um, and in our first discussions with them, we learned that many elephants were roaming for water. Namibia was going through a very extreme drought now. It's just getting worse and worse every year. Um, and the elephants um, are roaming for water. And so the human-elephant interaction is becoming more and more difficult. Um, after about a month of installation, um, my colleague at IUM, Martin, went back to see how things were going and what people were using the setup for. And I, and I can't obviously go through all of the things. I'm just going to pick out a couple that the purposes of my talk. And one of these was um, the system could be used. They hadn't used it yet, but it could be used to warn other villages about elephant movements and patterns so people can avoid their paths. Could also get in touch with the Conservancy uh, to let them know about their water problems, which are obviously a different a life and death situation. And some um, had already started modifying their solar setup. So, for example, um, for their own little phones, some people did have their own little phones, which they would take with them when they walked the long distance to Chunque, um, that, that they wouldn't fit into the um, power bank, so they cut the cables for, from the solar and stuck it into it. And, that, and they're used to doing those sort of workarounds. But that, that um, issue uh, between phone, solar, and water is not a new thing in the nine night. So all the Nerisi, uh, this, this is quite a big Nerisi. So, um, so this has quite a, um, quite a, uh, quite a lot of infrastructure for their, their, their water pump. So every Marisi has a, a water pump, a uh, solar charged water pump. The solar panels are over there. You can just see them in the bush. And then the um, power banks and everything and the um, inverters and things are quite behind this. But as you can see, it's accessible. Um, this is the most built infrastructure that you're ever likely to see there. This is built by the Conservancy to look after the water. Um, and um, when, so these, this setup has been there for 20, 30 years, something like that. When people started getting phones, maybe 10 years ago, um, the Conservancy then had to have community meetings to say, hey guys, so, like you can't chop the cables from the solar to charge your phones. And so they had to collectively agree not to customize the solar setup for the water. So this idea of customizing solar, yeah, issues about water, issues about all of those things, that there's a, a strong intertwining in whatever technology projects come there. And um, we perhaps didn't think quite so much how these things would be entwined, but it's good learning. Um, after about a couple of years of installation of our communication system, they made a video for a film festival. So the only thing that's in the public space now is their voices about this project, and you can look it up and watch their video. And they gave a particular telling of, um, of the project, uh, which at some point I'll, I'll um, 
So we have another telling of it, and, and that's the agreement. It's like, you tell it your way, we'll tell it our way. That's how we collaborate. We've all got different perspectives on it. And uh, they particularly emphasised that uh, this phone, this shared phone, was difficult to take from village to village because of the elephant movement. So it was dangerous to take it from place to place. Um, and in, in fact, actually during that time, um, elephants had completely crushed on the Nerisi. Um, uh, nobody was injured, but the, but the, 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 the small infrastructure that they had built for themselves was just finished. So finally, after three years of installation with COVID finally having opened up travel, I could go back home and I went back there last August and spent um, some time working on this and another project. Some of the systems are still working. Most of the phones and a lot of the software has completely crashed and died over that time because nobody could get there to it was a prototype. It was it wasn't supposed to be going for three years. We were supposed to be able to have gone back there to do things about it. Um, and so there had been, there was some uh, there was quite a, a, a bit of um, customization, particularly of the solar. Um, some with collective agreement. So for example, um, one Narisi, they said, oh, we haven't got a solar panel anymore. It's in Chumpe because it's used to start the car of one of our family members who works in Chumpe and drives back. And we need him to be able to start his car to come and help us rather than us have it here to charge. So, um, others have just, the sellers had not been a collective agreement. So they're all sort of interesting social discussions about that, probably that I won't ever write about because it is their story, it is their families. It's not for me to research about. Um, but what we learned from it is we had made a telecommunication system that was portable, but the Chumpa inhabitants through learning all of this had said that they wanted a system that was both fixed and untamperable, but then also had a little bit that could be customizable by individuals. Yeah, so, so um, and during our discussions, and I was sort of, we're talking about customization and appropriation, uh, it started to, to bring out um, tins of um, components. Um, so PCBs, um, batteries from power banks, um, old phones. Um, and if you imagine that most people there own about five things, including their sandals and their shorts and their t-shirts, this is like quite a little treasure trove that you might expect that us to keep these little bits but perhaps not in these kind of conditions after all, how you then solder these things and so on. So, so that's, that's a, there's a lot of hope in there. And there's an awful lot of imagination here. You can see that this um, uh, battery has been taken from an old power bank and it's been put onto a phone in order to use the flashlight on the phone. Um, and then that came up quite often. So that's um, left me wondering, but how do we best support this idea of hope and imagination in the context of deep uncertainty and risk and in a very uh, resource scarce environment? And so that's where that part of the talk ends, where the analysis should have gone a bit further, but maybe it's good to now actually say, this is what I'm thinking about. How do we use that stuff? So I'm going to pause that question now and really shift in another direction to another parallel project. Um, so in March 2020, just before um, lockdown, um, I went back, uh, was back there with, on another project with um, my colleagues in Cambridge. And I was checking up on the um, community network project, but that's just bubbling along in the background. Also, we thought at that time because we didn't know COVID was happening. So, um, what we were um, looking at then uh, with this project is how do we make um, comput computational tools for prediction um, in AI more accessible to, for people to use in the way that their knowledge is work to solve problems in their way? And specifically from um, Alan, my colleague, and my collaborator's interest is how do, how do we use probabilistic programming languages to um, help people design solutions for themselves on their data, not big data, local data sources. Um, and how can we do that as much as 
solar panels can be modified and stuck together. How do we how we how do we, how do we have those conversations? So um, then it's in this photo, I'm walking from a water hole, which is um, meters from where I sleep in the hut each night. And for, for, for people like us, it's just it's just beautiful. Every night I meditate with the elephants. Um, uh, and the waterhole and the huts are part of a lodge that hosts many researchers from around the world during the dry season. Because the Chukasei people are some of the most studied people in the world. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I haven't published so much, because it's so much there story and I want them to get their stuff out first before I do. Um, so it's a, there's a, a, a other, other things going on there too. Um, and people come and stay in this lodge, anthropologists have done fantastic work, um, geneticists, some more questionable work, um, and uh, technologists sometimes like us. So in the near to that water hole, there's that lodge building and inside the lodge, I don't know if you can see it there, um, is uh, some data that's been gathered about um, animals in, in the area. And it shows um, the annual gain count. Uh, so the conservancy brings in income by having um, uh, some wealthy people come shoot animals and uh, that money then goes back into the community and so do some of the dead elephants sometimes and you see bits of them hanging up. Um, elephants are in abundance there, not necessarily love like animals, but many, many other, many gamers. So monitoring the, the game count is important income. It's a, a part of the economy there. Um, as, as rough as that might sound to, to, to vegans and so on, this is part of the survival of people in that area. And there are graphs that plot the estimated animal population over the years. And how they get that is, um, this is also in the lodge buildings, um, is every year they have uh, the rangers um, count the animals who are visiting 18 water holes um, over a 48 hour period. And then those counts are fed, in, fed into scientific models to predict those species models and, and numbers and produce those graphs and then um, decide about where hunting can happen and so on. So this data is very valuable to uh, the conservancy um, and to ecologists and also to Namibia's world leading conservation efforts and its tourism industry, which is a massive part of its GDP. So those printed graphs tell stories, don't they? They tell stories about survival, they tell stories about relationships between local people and other economic systems and so on. Um, they're not the same stories though that Chumpasi trackers tell during their hunts. So somebody who's been working with Chumpasi um, uh, trackers for a long time, Louis Liebenberg, um, and who, who is a hunter himself, South African hunter, but he spent many years working with the trackers. Um, he, he talks about their, uh, the detailed stories that uh, Chumpasi people talk about the animals during their, their hunts. So usually when you're tracking, uh, there's no clear print, I print, clear track of prints um, in this dry, how hard the wind comes and so on. So the trackers interpret signs and conditions. So there might be a bent grass that hasn't just straightened, or there may be feces that's still wet and warm. And, and those things would show that an animal is still close. Um, They'll read occasionally scattered feces. So, so if feces is very scattered, it means that the animal's running and scared and maybe heading for a safer place, which they may know. So all of these clues inform the progress of tracking. They're stories that are being read and created by people as they understand the animal's behavior. Um, by creating these causal connections between these different signs. And Liebenberg says that during these, they also speculate to create novel facts to explain signs that don't otherwise fit together and would be meaningless. So there's sort of an imaginative, speculative aspect about explaining, or uh, maybe we can see this because maybe that's what the animal's doing and has now gone somewhere else. 
So unlike that static gain count of when you're sitting or when you're going to a water hole at a certain period of time and taking all the animal numbers down, um, trapping involves a lot of imagination, a lot of speculation. And the imagination increases the probability of locating the animals and um, learning more about behavior from the tracks. So yes, these two parts of stories are coming together, whether they should or not, I don't know. It's my, that's my imagination. Um, so about 25 years ago, Liebenberg applied his commitments to um, helping uh, Chumpasi and other sand people to inventing a field computer. And uh, this enables expert trackers to document data and the track, track uh, and um, trackers record numerous complex ob observations of animal behavior um, and they select the icons um, because their literacy is in the land and not necessarily written literacy. Um, so the cyber tracker knows, able to store details that they would normally perhaps forget from that moment of being there in, 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 in speculating and imagining and thinking about the behavior of animals and, and contribute to monitoring long-term ecological trends. Um, and it can also be put into large data sets and use statistical methods on it. And although it doesn't at the moment, but they are starting to think about how they can use it with um, uh, more sophisticated AI. So, um, and this is very important to indigenous um, livelihoods because it, it's, it's not just uh, about the um, economic effect of, uh, of, of money coming into the conservancy, it also um, is a signal um, for um, recognition of indigenous connections with land and given, in, given the abuse of um, their sovereignty of First Nations people, this is an important political thing as well as a technical thing. So we have to be careful when we kind of critique these kind of projects because they are doing multiple political things at the same time. But nonetheless, um, when fed into cyber tracker, we are using non-indigenous orderings. We are, they are um, categories that are imposed and properties that the icons represent uh, at the front end and at the back end when it goes in. So it's not, um, and the syntax of associating those categories and the properties is not necessarily the same um, relations and relationality that's being used in the in situ. They're also ordered by certain uh, traditions of programming languages and certain traditions of statistics. And all of those are within, in a particular culture of technology or cultures of technology. So, we are not looking at particularly at tracking, but this is a really good example to try to show you the, the, the disjunct if you weren't already aware of it. We are interested in probabilistic programming languages um, because they are uh, smaller scale and can be used without um, uh, requiring very large computers and a lot of energy. And um, potentially uh, they can be used, um, people can to learn to use them um, with, uh, if they, um, ordinary people can learn to use them rather than people who've got degrees in data science or whatever. And there have been um, efforts to use um, probabilistic programming languages in, uh, to teach programming and visual programming languages to teach programming with indigenous groups around the world, including in North Africa, um, not in Namibia yet. Um, but for all of those things, that there are, none of them are coming from their own languages. They are still a language that's imported into that situation. So we, we still have many, many um, barriers to try to bring these knowledges into communication about how to create things like programming tools that can work in a way where local people can be empowered to make the decisions about how the tools are actually made. Not even what the tools produce, but how to even make the tools. We need to have some way to bring bridge together. And we are starting at the level of 
bringing together mathematical concepts. Right? So how do we start talking very um, basically? How do we start um, having those conversations about what does predictions and probability mean for you in your life? And what does it mean for our mathematical abstractions? And how do we cross that, that thing? So we're now getting down to the not interfaces, but mathematics as we would say it. Um, and uh, probably this program language, language is used Bayesian inference. So if you know anything about Bayesian, one of the um, very accessible things to us um, is that Bayesian is built in a, um, on, on the basis of a prior. So a prior is something that you have an estimated guess about to begin with. That itself could have come from some other kind of um, AI, but just for the purposes of what we're thinking about, we're saying that comes from a human. So a human makes an educated guess about something, and then some predictions and some mass, mathematical um, um, quality uh, operations happen. And then based on their experience and looking at the prediction, then you can modify that. And then as you, you bet, so the training is not about finding a, a big correlations. It, it, the human is actually saying, yeah, I, I, it, it's, it, the human is very much more in the loop in training a Bayesian model. And there is some similarities, which is why I'm brought in the tracking and Liebenberg um, metaphor. There are some similarities with that to the way that Chumbasi uh, do uh, adapt their speculations to, during the hunt. So when they reflect upon um, the, the, an imaginative story, well, maybe the animal did this, and maybe the animal did that, maybe we'll follow that up. They are, in a sense, testing out their predict prediction and then coming back to their imaginative speculation and adjusting it based on new clues and new, new, imagine and new, new ways of looking at things. So there is some analog there about adjusting the likelihood of a prior and the observations um, that accrue in a Bayesian inference and, and, and on learning. So, there, so that's one of the reasons it appealed to us. So, yes. So as I said, we're not analyzing um, tracking, um, uh, but tracking does give me this good way of Explaining, explaining the potential compatibility of a Bayesian approach to this. And um, it also uh, gives me a way of introducing another concept, which is imagine that we're on a hunt and we're following clues as, as we go along. So we're, with that imagination about what was happening to an animal and what we might do to follow the animal and what might happen next, we are forming knowledge around our speculations and our imaginations and our hypotheses. And as we go along, we're alongly integrating them. This is very different than going to water holes and picking up data in a 24 hour period. But at the same time, we're also creating a path through the bush. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello. 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 Um, so, but the, so at the same time, we're also creating a path through the bush. So our bodies are actually connected to those traces as we, that we're, we're inscribing them and we're connected to, to the stories that we're putting in the earth and making up our hypotheses things. These are not abstract things, this is embodied, deeply embodied in us. So as you probably know, Trina very well knows very well, um, Tillingo calls this inhabitant knowledge. And he distinguishes it from this knowledge that I talked about, game counts separated, um, which is, um, he calls occupant knowledge, uh, which could also be knowledge that you assembled from interviews with indigenous people. At their Narisi, when I just come in for, you know, an afternoon at 40 Narisi spread across 90,000 kilometers, I'm not going to exactly be able to get that, 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 um, uh, inhabitant knowledge, right? So my knowledge 
in many ways, even though I'm very well known for spending a long time in situ compared to most people, um, that my knowledge is still very much disembodied from that part of the movement. <coughs> So we can incorporate that occupant knowledge into inhabitant knowledge when we speculate. So some of that knowledge from those game counts might actually get put back into the inhabitant knowledge, right? Of people who are not using counting, uh, 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 that it might shape what they're, so it's not like they're, they're, they're two separate things. They can have a, a, a cross talk, um, but, the more our inhabitant knowledge shapes our speculations, the more they connect to the reality created in this particular space, in this place, in this time. So, um, and connecting our movements and animals' movements and the environment, we are making together, we're making that space together as we go along. And in fact, Liebenberg describes how it's really important to trackers when that they identify themselves with the animal that they are um, tracking as they anticipate its route. So he writes that um, uh, frequently then when they're doing this imaginative speculation, they, um, they, they think about what the animal would do next and how much time we get there. Um, and, and, and they, and they, um, there's a lot of anthropomorphic reconstruction going along. Um, and he compares this to scientific thought, which may be something very familiar to you. So physicists like Einstein will say that he had a sympathetic understanding of being a light beam. Like years ago, I was a biologist. I read many biographies who write of anthropomorphic experiences. And I definitely had anthropomorphic experiences with my honeybees. Like there was no, that was part of my knowledge building. So tracking is, is like scientific imagination in predicting. Did anybody see, oh, I am on, I realize I'm not. Did anybody see this movie, The Octopus Teacher? So if you get a chance to see this movie, it's lovely, it's a few years old, it's very much a COVID movie, I think of it. It's um, uh, not about COVID, but the, um, the, uh, narrator in, the, the, in this movie um, drew a, a, a lot of his inspiration from the sound people who had who'd also made another movie with many years before. And, and he talks about his empathetic engagement um, with the setting that sound people, like the truth people, and he had with his octopuses. So if you want to sort of see how that, that that's quite a, a nice movie to watch. Um, And it's also worth, worth, worth knowing that um, in, in, in uh, sand storytelling traditions, um, animals were formerly people. So animals have human characteristics and, um, they, and humans can acquire animal characteristics when needed to, to get themselves out of um, problem. Uh, as I keep on saying, our work is not about tra tracking. And we certainly really, it's really important to us to avoid any kind of essentialism here about, you know, chunkwasi people do this, their spirituality is like that. Um, so our aim in the Cambridge project is to, 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 to explore how we can relate mathematical concepts to local knowledge practices in order to design um, pedagogies and digital tools that will enable future generations in Africa to design, to create AI according to their own values. And they can't do that if they don't have any access to the math mathematics involved in it. Bayesian inference isn't usually taught in schools, even in Europe. So our approach is both about um, the mass curricula and technology design in the Cambridge project, not the other project. So this is the first trip to Namibia um, for um, Alan, who's a computer scientist with expertise in data and language modeling and Helen, um, a math teacher who in the UK. And while disappointingly there were no elephants roaming then because it was a wet season, um, uh, for them it was disappointing. 
But the elephants just keep on coming up in all the stories because that's such a problem there at the moment because of the drought. So for instance, when we first talked to Charlie, this is Charlie, one of our collaborators there, um, uh, about local understandings of prediction and statistics, he spoke about warning elephants to take care if they encountered elephants, uh, warning children if they, to take care if they encountered elephants in the bush and that an elephant had nearly killed his dad. And um, we've been talking about maths in the curriculum. Uh, Charlie has many, many years experience of translating triple say for researchers of many different disciplines. His, his name is as a linguist um, uh, for many, many eminent um, anthropological um, texts and language texts. And he's been very much involved. He's a very humble man that lives in just the same ordinary, humble place that you might see in the images that I genuinely don't show people. Uh, uh, so um, we'd asked up Charlie for examples of everyday local life when people might predict. And I, I said, you know, what about when you're predicting animals? And he said, oh, um, yes, people count elephants to identify a herd and, and, and tell stories about behavior, especially to tourists. And, and then he said, um, yeah, so for example, a, a lone elephant might be aggressive. Um, so if you just see one elephant, it, it, it might be sick. You know, when I'm sick, I'm grumpy, and I don't want noise, and I don't want people around. And that's probably true for elephants. So for him, the number one was an indicator, um, more than an abstract count. It was actually something other than, than just an abstract count. It was something about emotions and self-experiences and being grumpy and, and so on. But that's not, um, that's not unusual. We associate numbers with many different meanings. If I said the word couple, you know exactly what comes with the number two in that context um, or how we think of pairs. So this is a, 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 a picture dictionary in Kimpase language created by local artists. And, and you'd never see um, pictures of just one, one animal print, right? Because it doesn't really make sense to have just the one. Um, so, so this is not sort of like some kind of unusual thing, but it's def something they definitely don't think about when we teach people to think about numbers and statistics. So it's just not at the front of mind that actually numbers have stories and they mean many things and they come with emotions. Come with emotions. Um, it can, num numbers can be grumpy. Um, so, uh, so we've, we've had many discussions about mathematics with cur curricula and how people learn in the village uh, and scenarios when people make predictions um, in, the, in, the, in the school, in the village school, which is different than the high school, uh, with traditional leaders and people in conservancy, tribal authorities and so on. And with a, a, a Bruce, who was an American teacher here at the time, uh, working on work with the community for decades. Um, and, and, and we, we were asking him about his experience of accounting there. And, and he said, well, you know, because people are not accumulating many things, often the, there was uh, the numbers that they mentioned quite inconsistent because they're not doing it very often. Although I think that's, um, I think they're inconsistent perhaps because they're attached to different stories. Yeah. So we discussed, um, Okay, so if you can't use numbers, what can we do to have um, conversations about um, probability and prediction with people? And we decided to use spinners to play games of chance and um, then analyzing what took place. So we made these paper spinners um, and you put a paper clip or a piece of a broken fence and you spin it round and flipping the long end of the paper and then we change you know, the different sectors depending on things. And this is uh, designed to help us discuss conditional probability. So we might have several sets of things. If, if uh, depending on the outcome of one spinner, then you'd use one or other of two other spinners. So there would be a chain of spinners that we, we use. Uh, but first of all, we needed a scenario that makes sense, a story. Why would children uh, need to, to, to have something with a bit of risk in it, a bit of chance, a bit of, um, a bit of um, uh, 
uh, prediction in it. We went round round to visit Narisi and asked them to some stories that were, when would you would need, need children need to learn this? And amongst many things, the idea of getting water once again came up over and over again because it's so vital to survival. And they spoke of many different ways that teach children to, um, uh, to, to extract water in addition to the, if they're out in the bush and they're not near the borehole. Um, so they described um, extracting water from tubers or succulent trees and from puddles, and then also trapped in the crooks of or holes in trees. So when they were discussing looking for water in a tree, a man said that children had to learn to take care in case there's a snake in the hole. It's quite easy talking to people in Queensland about this because you don't go a snake in the hole. Um, <laughs> so, but, so, and this scenario is really familiar to everyone we spoke to in Tumpe. So children from about 10 years old should um, hear stories about extracting about water and they should learn to be take care that if you're looking for water in the foot of the tree, they need to throw a rock in it for, to see if make it us. Thank you for coming. Um, so, the game involves three spinners. One represented whether there's a hole in the tree, whether or not there's a hole in the tree. One, whether the hole contained water. And the third, whether the hole contained a snake. And we play the, these games. And we played them with different groups of um, young people because of um, our ethics uh, agreement with, in, in Namibia, uh, people were all over um, 16 years old. So they're not real little children. So people fed back on that, and some participants queried whether or not somebody would actually go into the bush on their own. And then some people questioned the plausibility of the amount that we put, or 50 50, for example. They said, oh no, it can't be like that. It's not like that. Um, uh, other people said, oh, it's only going to have, have um, water in the tree if it's been raining. And, you know, there's lots of critique about. Um, our, our game, but overall, um, they, they really, really enjoyed playing this game. And they got very excited about playing the game. And this is not, this is, this is essentially young people, nearly grown ups. Um, as children often get school into their early 20s in, in that area, so that's what we keep. So, schooling is so incompatible with their um, knowledge. Um, but they, um, uh, they play the game and they would tell stories around playing the game. And, uh, uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I did, I, I did check up, are we doing something that could be actually traumatic for people, you know, getting them to play a game with snakes and, snake and things. It's, people die, very, die easily in that area. So maybe that's not such a good idea to play a game where you've got form, a bad memory about something. And they and uh, and one and Pat Monfort said, "Yeah, it is a scary game, but algebra is a lot more scary." <laughs> so we played the skin again. It's been a game with, with with different groups, and um, some of them are. Uh, some of the older groups were really trying to take the mathematical knowledge that learned at school, which they were really struggling with because they are translating it through three languages. They learn it, it's, it's taught in English at school. Then the lingua franca in the mixed, mixed school there is often Afrikaans, but their home language is Tunquasais. But so they are so many levels away from this, this language of, that they're, they're, they're reading. So they were trying to use this as a way of bringing, <laughs> these are spin again as a way of, 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 of showing their, the problems they have in their own schools. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate all teaching is in English in Namibia, um, wherever you are. Um, and it's also unfortunate to get to university that you have to have a, um, have a high grade in English because you can't possibly understand the maths or the science otherwise. So that's the thing. Um, so I'm noticing I'm way behind time, so I'm going to squeeze up really quickly. You can ask me questions at the end. Um, one of the things that came through um, with the storytelling around the spinner games is that um, 
without prompting, people often said as they moved, you know, you, one, one person would say, did you get, did you get um, a snake or water on your go? Um, and then they start putting a time frame to that. So sometimes they say this day, the next day, and they moved it across. Every time you spin again, oh, this is tomorrow. You spin again, this is the next day. Every time you had a new turn. Um, sometimes they use years. So um, one, one group was saying it took seven years to find a water hole, water in a hole. Um, another group said, yeah, but it took six years for you to find a snake and then die. So it takes you six years to die. <laughs> so, so there was this, um, with the excitement of the storytelling around the spinner, there was also this temporal register being brought in. So that they would talk about this would happen one day or not on another day. And um, as you can see here, very frequently when they're counting the number of times you type in a, 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 a to, to thing. This, this young lady, the young woman is maybe about 20, 22. So she's not a child, I just want to say that. So. Um, uh, she, but um, they, they often use their fingers. And so it was almost like I often got the sense of um, that these temporal registers were being embodied in the way of counting as well. So there's that other kind of embodied connection that I noticed. I'm really going to go through too far. I shouldn't have put two bits together. But the thing, I. Uh, So the thing I wanted to get across when with um, these was this temporal register. Time just kept on coming up this day, next day, years, um, those sorts of things. Um, and uh, when we asked um, the stories aside from the spin again, temporal registers all, all also came up. So when we left, um, when we left, uh, we had to leave because COVID lockdown started and the last place you want to find yourself is a group of some of the most fragile people on the earth when you, you just want to leave them be and that's the ethical thing to do. Um, uh, so we had to carry on doing our research with Charlie and other people by WhatsApp for the next two years. And so we were doing debriefs on the spinner games and more storytelling. And frequently, um, without any kind of prompts about these temporal things, these temporal conditions would often come up in the stories. So it might be quite a subtle one, like it was a poor rainy season, it was last rainy season, it was very hot that day, but there, there, there's always a temporal context to things. And... And what started happening to me when I started the finished analysis of this part, which, which is published, which part is published, is that when we teach probability, like if we teach a dice, what we look is at when the dice actually lands. So what has happened, with the, the conditions that made it go from, say, throwing a six, is it a six now? We don't we're not thinking about what's happening midair as the as the dice is spinning and all the, that time in it but those sorts of things seem to come up in the stories the alongly temporal context of stories of um, counting the spinners and a lot of the excitement anticipation imagination comes in that the, the embodiment of our temporality rather than the abstraction, abstract count. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that reminded me of um, Helen Barron's work where she says numbers are actually embodied in, in the counting of the market. And so one of the things that, um, and, and, and Trina, I, 
people who know narrative know this much better than I, than I even can pretend to, to say, is that in our imaginations, time is experienced, it's not measured or abstracted, it's, it's we are part of it and it is part of us. But when we're doing mathematics or when we're teaching mathematics or science, we treat the passage of time as something that we're outside of and can control. And it's not a context for our feelings, for our hopes, for our storytelling. And that to me is one first step in how thinking about how we can bridge this big gulf that we have to start to appreciate that the things that we are abstracting out and realizing that sometimes for imagination in a hunt or deciding to stick, uh, you know, make cut, cut a solar panel or all of those things, that, that, that when we are doing that abstraction and doing that cutting out of the embodied nature of time to make our numbers more handleable or our water counting, we are also cutting out all of the experiences that actually can create imagination in our, our world and create problem solving. So we are at 10 minutes too. It's a great shame that I don't get the chance to give you the next bit of the, um, some of these other stories. As you can see, this is all the stuff that I'm supposed to have analyzed before this talk. I'm gonna end on this one. So during that period of WhatsApp messages, when we were asking about Charlie's stories, who would write some stories about the bitch you go away and talk to some people in the village, it was COVID, like, you know, he's had limited movements himself. Um, he would write these, these stories on WhatsApp to us and then we would read them and then I'd write back and say, well, what do you mean by that, Charlie? Or does this happen often, Charlie? Will you really see a coup that often, you know, or is that normal? You know, tell me a bit more. And he had this one story which I will end on. And this is a story that happened to him, but it's a story that um, he's heard quite often. So, so he, he woke up one, one day, um, two years ago, and uh, it had been another period of great scarcity, um, a lot of um, starvation and um, uh, uh, difficulties in the village. And so that, that day he woke up, well, he hoped for that day, so he went out with his dog and um, came across a kudu. Really lucky that he got there just before the jackals were eating it. So it was dead, ready to be eaten. There it was. They basically food for the village for the next month and the jackals hadn't got it. So he's just like, what a relief, you know, this is just fantastic. Knew something's always gonna happen today. I had such a lot of hope. So then starts walking back to the village looks up right next to the kudu, there is big, big honey, a bit of high, full of honey. And it's like, like meat, honey? What more could, could a John say person want at this time? Gets back to the village, dis discovers that somebody's shot a giraffe, which is very, very sad, actually, because they're my favorite animals. But they, but, um, uh, so there was even more food and some money because the hunter had shot a giraffe. You get a lot of money, the conservative governments would get a lot of money for that. So like everything had gone really well for that day. So th we, this is a story, um, I think we asked him, uh, can you give us a story about your lucky day? And this was his story about a lucky day. So we unpacked some of the sort of, you know, how often those things happen and so on. And where I'm gonna end you on, um, uh, so one of these questions, this is, this is kind of a question that we'd ask in WhatsApp. And then this is kind of answer we get in WhatsApp. This is actually just directly taken from WhatsApp. So we said, does a person telling the story wake up with hope? Um, why does a person wake up with hope? So he's now reflecting, why did I wake up with such a hopeful feeling that day? And then he says, well, dreams, you know, sometimes your dreams can tell you that those sorts of things, particularly if something positive or negative. Um, sometimes it's a, it's a bit of faith. It could be a religious or spiritual thing. And so then sometimes it's just a thought. If you really wake up with a really positive attitude to life, then those things happen to you, don't it? So there was this very, and, and this is, you know, you can see this is not 
um, unusual. It's not rocket science, but it's a it's a um, thinking about um, prediction and um, storytelling in ways which invest feelings and or felt experiences, emotions in prediction that I think can be a very useful way forward. And I'm going to end there because I really haven't got through like nearly half the stories. I think you just ask me questions now. Yeah. I can send you a number of recording versions. Yeah.